everybody. Pick, pick, you're freeing me. I'm liberated. Now I can keep moving. I am so excited to be here because this is an organization that I preach about, talk about. If you Google me and mentoring, you will see me preaching dramatically about the power of individuals in the lives of our young people and the urgent importance. And so being that they did not give me the normal allotted time to a black Baptist preacher, about two hours, I had my collection plate all ready to be passed around. Uh, I'm going to just jump right in and just let you all know the urgency. I had the privilege last year of, of being the commencement speaker at Stanford, and I told, I confessed to the crowd, like I will confess to you right now, I want you all to feel sympathy for me because I grew up with these two parents who told me the same stories over and over and over again. 40 years now, I don't know what it is, I am an adult, but my parents have not stopped trying to parent me with these stories. My mom just puts things on automatic pilot when she sees me, I walk out of the house, she says, son, get a coat and comb your hair. I'm like, mom, I don't have hair anymore. Why are you saying that? So my, my parents told me though, growing up, as they told me the same stories over and over again, they told me, son, that you are the physical manifestation of a conspiracy of love. A conspiracy of love. And the reality is, as I listen to their stories, my mom who has a penchant for accuracy and detail, and my dad who has a penchant for hyperbole and exaggeration, <laughs> as I listen to their stories, the truth is it does come out. You see, my dad was born uh, poor, at which point if he was here, he would yell at me, don't tell those people I was poor, because I was not poor, I was po, P-O, I couldn't afford the other two letters. <laughs> my dad was born a po boy from North Carolina, he was born in the mountains, and even though I argue with him all the time, because he seems to exaggerate climactic patterns, he told me last year that he had a tsunami that hit his town in his childhood. And I'm like, Dad, that's not possible. You lived in the mountains. You could not have had a tsunami. And he gets indignant. He doesn't back up. He gets indignant. He says, son, it was before the internet. You can't look it up, but it happened. <laughs> My father, who had this childhood, who was in a geographic anomaly where he had this steep hill to walk from home to school, and then a steep hill walking up to go home again. My father tells me, being born to this single mom, his mom couldn't take care of him. And so he tells this story about people in that town that would not let one child fail. A family took him in and others looked after him. He had so many interventions in his life, so many positive adults. By the time he got to, uh, got to, got to be high school age, he had no tradition of college in his family. But he had so many people telling him that that was where he should go, modeling that behavior, that he actually started to believe he could. And then when he couldn't afford it, people in this town, whose names I don't know, put dollar bills in envelopes to make sure he could afford his first semester's tuition at North Carolina Central University. Yes! And then when my parents got to college, it was amazingly, they landed right in the middle of the civil rights movement in the 60s. And I don't know these folks' names, but my parents went to school with heroes. I had the privilege of being the commencement speaker for my mom's university on her 50th reunion, and I went down to Fisk University thinking I was important. I went down there, people said, who are you? I said, I'm the commencement speaker. They had a banquet just like this for the honorary degree recipients, and the, and the commencement speaker sat at the head table. But I don't know what it is about mothers. This power you all have. No matter how important your child thinks they are, you can always make them feel like they're 12. And so my mom comes to the table and she says, get up, get up. And I'm like, mom, I'm eating, I'm talking to the provost. Get up from that table, boy, come here. And she starts pulling me by the hand and she starts pulling me and I'm like, mom, let go. I'm the mayor, mom, let go of me. But she starts pulling me to table to table, like this room right here, and she pulls me over and says, you need to meet this young person. It was her classmate who led the voter registration drives at the time that it was dangerous to do so. You all remember Goodwin and Cheney and Schwarner. Then she took me to another table and said, you need to meet this woman. She led our boycott of the local store that wasn't serving blacks. 
She was going around saying, these aren't people you're going to meet in history books, but these are the people, average, ordinary American citizens who did extraordinary acts of kindness, decency, and love. When my parents got to Washington, D.C., both college graduates landed there. They actually lived in the same building, and my mom, my dad, got lucky, met my mom. Even a blind squirrel finds a nut sometimes. <laughs> and my mom had the charity to measure, m marry my father. And they found in Washington, D.C., at a time that companies weren't hiring blacks, and I don't care if you're Irish or you're Jewish, at some point you were excluded in this country. But I tell you, there were people that came together, blacks and whites, I don't know their name, this conspiracy of love that helped my parents get their first jobs as companies hired blacks for the first time. Amazingly, once they both started working for a company called IBM as a wave of first African Americans, getting that opportunity opened those doors by other people. They did so well, they got promoted in the New York City office. In New York, they land and they start looking for homes to live in in New Jersey, but they find out that people won't show black couples homes in white neighborhoods. And so what happened? Ordinary Americans volunteered their time with an organization called the Fair Housing Council to help my parents out. Blacks and whites came together and amazingly, my parents would go to a house, they would be told it was sold, the couple would come behind them, the white couple, my father said they were Mr. and Mrs. Brown, son, but they were not brown, they were white. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but heck, they came and they, they looked at the house and of course it was still for sale, the house my parents loved. Listen to this, it's amazing. They were told it was sold, the Browns showed up, they were told it was still for sale, they put a bid on the house, it was accepted on the day of the closing. Instead of the Browns showing up, my father showed up with a young lawyer whose name I don't remember, I don't know. And the lawyer walked into the real estate agent with my dad next to him and said, you are in violation of New Jersey fair housing law. And he started giving him a speech, don't applaud yet because the real estate agent stood up. See, he got caught in a sting. He punched my dad's lawyer in the face. Sig the dog on my dad. Now the size of the dog has changed over the years. <laughs> my dad swears it's Stephen King's Cujo. <laughs> my mom looks down embarrassingly and says it was just Dorothy's Toto. <laughs> and so this was the house. After a big court case, we moved into a small house in a small town called Harrington Park, New Jersey, as my father called us, the four raisins in a tub of sweet vanilla ice cream. <laughs> and my dad would look at his son in one generation from the depth of poverty, from challenging circumstance. One generation, his kids are growing up with ample opportunity that was dangerous for him to even dream of as a child. One generation made real, made possible, not by presidents, not by famous leaders we read in history books, but by ordinary people who did extraordinary acts of kindness and decency and love, small interventions that produced powerful change. I don't know if those people who gave my dad a dollar to go to college realized what kind of return on investment that they would get. I don't know if those people that helped my parents get their jobs knew that generations yet unborn would benefit from their love, but that's the truth. It is the law of, ther the first law of thermodynamics. You can't destroy energy. If you give out love, it goes on forever. The stars we see in the sky tonight are from of stars billions of light years away. They may be gone and dead, but the energy still lives. It's immutable. We have a choice in life. We can play large or we can shrink ourselves. We can be small or we can be brilliant. And the problem is right now is we just give up opportunities every single day to shine our light. My father used to look at me as an American growing up in this century, in this decade, as a boy at 18 years old, he'd see me going in the fridge, opening the door, and I'd close the fridge, and I'd see him standing there, and he'd be shaking his head. And I'd go, what's wrong with you, man? And my father would look at me and go, boy, don't you dare walk around this house like you hit a triple. You were born on third base. You drank deeply from wells of freedom and liberty and opportunity that you did not dig. You eat lavishly from banquet tables prepared for you by your ancestors. Your job is not to sit back consuming, getting fat, dumb, and happy. Your job is to get involved, to be a part of the conspiracy.
And so this is what pains me right now. This is why I traveled all the way from New Jersey to land here for less than like eight hours and be with you for a few moments and then fly back in the red eye in a few moments. This is why I did this. Because this is an organization that, that gets young people in the lives of other older adults and creates transformations, not just for the mentor and the mentee, but that love between those two individuals creates transformative change for societies. This is what America was built on. Not the great grandiose acts of mayors or, or senators or presidents or uh, corporate CEOs, it's those acts of kindness and decency of love one to another that generate such, such beauty, such strength, such power. Alice Walker said, why is what the most common way people give up their power is not realizing they have it in the first place. We have so many people that just with four hours a month, the amount of time we spend watching our favorite TV show in a month, and I know you folks out here in California, your favorite TV show is Jersey Shore, Jersey Licious, Real Housewives of New Jersey. I know you watch those shows. <laughs> Giving that up, that time, can make change. And what is the consequences? Well, I'll tell you what the consequences are. Almost all my life, I have been a mentor since I was a teenager at Stanford University. But there was one little period I wasn't. I was getting ready to run for mayor of Newark. Now, I had been living in some high-rise public housing projects as a city councilman. And, and, I, and I was running for mayor now. And by the way, I had, I had lived in the buildings for a long time, so I would come home and I'd see young people growing up, and some young kids were hanging out in my lobby. And I remember one of them, he, he reminded me, his name was Hassan, reminded me so much of my dad, the same sense of humor, the same free-loving spirit, the same leadership and charisma. And one day I started seeing them show colors, and I recognized they were showing to show signs of being in a gang. And then I came home and I started smelling some wacky tobacco that I had only smelled at a Stanford dorm that I knew. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I've got to do something about this. And so I started bringing the young guys out to movies and dinners, a small group of them, inviting friends of mine with them. Some of my friends who had gotten involved in the drug trade and had, thank God, gotten out and had testimony to tell them things were going well until I got busy because the mayor's race was going on. I was running for mayor. And I got too busy to continue these relationships. And, and, and the young kids didn't forget, though, because I'd come home and they would be there waiting for me. The end of long days of campaigning, sometimes they'd have lawn signs, like, phalanxing me as I walked to the elevator. And I was so pleased to see them until I thought, where did you guys get those lawn signs? Whose lawn did you pull them out of? <laughs> I get elected mayor, and one of the first things that happened was I get elected mayor and I get death threats. And, so suddenly I started walking home with guys with big guns protecting me, and the kids that hang out in the lobby didn't hang out. But I didn't notice it because I was so busy. I'm championing my career. I'm now mayor of the city, and crime is happening all across the city, and I'm, I am going to stop the crime. And so I'm running out there to every shooting in our city. It's spiking in those years. I'm a young mayor, still have the new mayor smell. It's my first month. And I'm showing up on shooting scenes in that first 60, 30 days. And, 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 and about 30 days into my job, I'm on a street corner talking to residents while there literally is a body on the ground covered by a sheet. And I'm not even paying attention to it. I'm, I'm catering to my residents saying, we can do better than this. Let's pull together. I, I, I'm the mayor. Listen to me. Together, we're going to make change. And I go back home that night feeling inspired, feeling dedicated, feeling strong. And then I get the report of who was the person that was on the body on the floor, on the ground, murdered. It was Hassan. His funeral, I will never forget, because everyone was there. <coughs> Teachers and community leaders and politicians. It was packed. It's a funeral home in my city called Perry's. We were down in the room, and it was just wall-to-wall -wall people all cursing the darkness that brought about this death of a child. Everybody standing present and accounted for to, 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 to deplore the situation. And the more I heard the talking, 
I, I, I was mayor, but I didn't feel like mayor. I felt like a kid. I just looked around me and I saw enough. I left and I walked back to City Hall. I, I went into this hollowed office in this, this historic building, closed the doors, this grand palatial mayor's office. And all I could do was lock the door, hope my staff wouldn't hear me, because I sat down there and cried. God had put this kid right in front of me. He, he was my dad, born under the same circumstances to a single mom, tough economic circumstances. He was my father in personality, my dad in spirit, and I wasn't like those people in North Carolina. I walked past him, so busy with my life that I did not take the time. And then what do we do at his funeral? We all show up. Everybody could show up for his death, but why couldn't we show up for his life? You see, the problems we have in America, the challenges we face with our young people are not beyond our capacity to do something about them. It's not a matter of can we stop these problems? Can we meet these challenges? It's not an issue of can. It's an issue of will. Will we do it? And I know the story of America. I've heard it from the mouths of my parents. We have this wonderful declaration of independence, but the true spirit of this country, evidenced in this room, is a declaration of interdependence. That we need each other. We have an old African parable. If you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. Reach out to someone, touch someone. It does not take much. An hour here, an hour there, an act of kindness there, some caring and some compassion, some understanding that our destinies are interwoven and intertwined together. This organization knows that. But we have a long way to go. It's unacceptable to me that there are hundreds of kids on a waiting list. How can that be? When there are tens of thousands of people in this city alone that could be stepping up and doing what's necessary, we've got to wake folk up, get people out of their state of sedentary agitation. When they're so upset to complain about the problems in the world, but they won't get up off their couches and do something about it. We have people. who allow their inability to do everything about a problem to undermine their determination to do something. And it doesn't take everything, it takes a little something from us all. I stand here tonight with pride in this room, with depth of gratitude, because the love that we are showing here, the love that each one of the people that makes this organization possible, the love of every mentee and mentor, that love is the very generation of hope. That love evidenced here will change generations yet unborn. The love that is here is the light in the darkness. The love that is here is the very torch of the American dream. And so tonight I, I I say Godspeed, I say Yashukoa, I say let's continue the fight. I want to end with just a, a, a small little moment if I can. I, I, I tell you, I, I have seen tough days with, with our, our kids in Newark. I, I've seen so many avoidable tragedies happen with almost a regularity of, of a drumbeat uh, marking our, our, our inadequacies, inadequacies or, or more accurately, our lack of will. But I, I've come to be, in my experiences, a guy that is, is, is full of hope because I see it in the smallest interactions every single day. What, what, what is the truth of who we are is that this conspiracy still lives. My, my mom and dad wanted me, my, my brother, to just 
Never forget, no matter how bad things get, how many dark days you have, if you could just get up and do something small for someone, that little spark of kindness is enough to ignite the flames of hope and possibility again. And so I, I just want to go back to, to my dad and, 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 and if I can, and, and please don't make fun of him and, or me, I don't know if the story is true or not. But I want to just end with this note of my dad and his school. My, my dad says, Corey, son, that uh, I went to my school and climbed over mountains to get there and wild beasts roaming the streets and asteroids coming down times. And, and I would make it to school and I, I sat in the back of that classroom and one day, on the first day of school, this teacher came in the classroom. And she stood up before the class and she said, Class, today I want to teach you all about self-esteem. If there's anybody from the South here, forgive me for butchering that accent. <laughs> I want to teach you all about self-esteem. Now, anybody in this classroom thinks you're stupid, I want you to stand up right now. And my father said, Every, all the kids just sat there, who's this woman? And she repeated herself, standing there impatiently, crossing her arms, all upset. Come on now, I want to I know who thinks you're dumb, who thinks you're, if you think you're stupid, stand up, let me see who you are. And my father said, left to look around, seeing this woman standing there, demanding that stupid people stand up. He just pushed his chair back, and my father said, he stood up. And the woman looks at him and says, Mr. Booker Boy, what's wrong with you? You think you're dumb, you think you're stupid? And my father said he was just a little boy, but he scratched his head and says, well, shucks, ma'am, I don't really think I'm stupid, but I didn't want you to be the only one standing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is our country, it's our destiny. We must stand up. We must stand because people stood for us. They fought for us. They bled the soil of this country red for us. We must stand up because, as King said, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability. <laughs> It must be carried in on people's backs who are willing to stand and carried in. We must stand. We must stand because what Frederick Douglass says is true. In life, you don't get everything you pay for, but you must pay for everything that you get. We must stand because there are people that need our love. We must stand because there's people that need our hope. We must stand because there's people that need our example. We must stand. And like a chorus of consciousness, we must awaken the moral imagination of others. We must stand because this country needs people that still believe in those five words our children say in a profound pledge from Newark to Oakland that we are a nation with liberty and justice for all. This is not a dream. This is our destiny. And we will make it so if we stand and stand together and reawaken the conspiracy of love. Thank you, everybody.